Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the church today. I worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the whole earth stand in the enter the stand and dang it. All of him. For he comes to judge the earth and the people with his truth. Good morning. Good morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, from whom all blessings come, be with us today as we gather here. Lead us in our worship this day, that our lips may praise you, our lives may bless you, and our words and thoughts glorify you. We ask your blessings on those who cannot be with us here today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. What a friend. look at our announcements this morning. Remember the offering box in the foyer as you come and go today. And of course Sunday school after service. If you'd like to stay for that, that's wonderful. Okay, sunrise service being planned for next Sunday. We'll start at 645. We were breakfast. There's a sign-up sheet. If you'll just bring some sort of breakfast food or something, we'll see how that one goes this year. It looks like we've got several signed up so far. Uh, and then we'll start regular service at 8.30. So let those know who don't come to Sunrise that we'll have service at 8.30. Uh, any other comments, questions, details about that? 
Okay. Um, choir practice. Our choir practice last week didn't quite work out. We had a technical issue. And so we're going to try choir practice again this week at 6. And you see the choir is up here, so we didn't practice anything, so we got a rerun today. So, uh, anyway, we will have choir practice at 6. We have a card this morning from uh, Mildred. Thank each of you for the cards and prayers. They meant so much to me. I miss coming to church. My love and prayers to all. God bless from Mildred. Okay, I think that's all the announcements I have. Anybody have any other announcements now? Okay. Yes, sir. Carol Town Briggs had a service of darkness Friday at Summit Pavilion right up from the church at 7 o'clock. Okay. It's a painful uh, service. At 7 o'clock at Germantown Brick at their pavilion. At the pavilion they have at Germantown Brick. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Choir is going to sing now then. So here we go. We're glad to have Kenny King with us again this morning. Uh, Adam's off today. Adam will be here next Sunday for the sunrise service. Um, so at this time, um, let's take prayer. Oh, we're going to go ahead and sing. So let's all stand and sing where he leads me, I will follow.
Okay, we've got uh, prayer concerns listed in your bulletin. We've got people listed to send a card to. Other uh, other prayer concerns or praises that we have this morning. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Okay. G.W. Thurman, biting cancer. Family of Thomas James. Okay. Family of Thomas James. Family of Johnny Allman. Family of Pain. She had she can't hardly walk. She's had it injured her knee. She's going to have surgery. Okay. Diane Ames injured her knee, going to have surgery, having walking difficulties. Loving her. Loving her. Been out of the hospital, nursing home. Okay, yeah, she's, yeah, been in the hospital and nursing home, not home yet. Gladys Wade. What was the first name? Gladys. Gladys Wade. All the people have been in the past those. Tornadoes. Yeah, more tornadoes again all across the Midwest. Yes, ma'am. Uh, family of Buin Frith, Betty Taylor's back in the hospital. What's going on this time? She fell. She fell. Ooh. Family of Willie Joe Hundley. Family of Willie Joe Hundley. Anybody else? So we got a lot of problems. We're hoping for a good Easter. So we're going to look forward to better things. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Kenny. We'll turn the service over to you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad to be back again. Appreciate the opportunity to come back. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this church. Thank you for this community. Please be with the ones that was brought up for prayer and the ones that was unspoken. Please lay your healing hands on, on them as you see they, their needs and be guidance to them as they do their journey, through their journey of healing and allow them to be a light to others that are around them in the facilities for we are the ones that people see uh, Jesus through us allowing us to be ministers to others as you have called us to do in your name we pray amen today's Palm Sunday and the scripture I have chosen is the usual Palm Sunday scripture Mark 11 1 through 11. When they approached Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near Mount Olives, he sent two of his disciples and told them, Go into the village ahead of Go into the village ahead of you. As soon as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one has ever sat has, no one has ever sat. Untie it, bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here right away. So they went and found a colt outside in the street, tied by the door. They untied it, and some of those standing there said to them, What are you, what are you doing untying the colt? They answered them, just as Jesus said, so they let them go. They brought the donkey to Jesus and threw their cloth on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their clothes on the road as others spread leafy branches cut from the field. Those who went ahead, of, ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. He went into Jerusalem and into the temple after looking around everything since it was already late. He went to Bethany with the twelve. <coughs> doing the best I can, doing the best I can, not what God's looking for. Looking for a different 
take on Palm Sunday? Here it is. Over 2,000 years ago, the Sadducees had a tradition they believed the Messiah would show up four days before Passover. They kept the gate of the temple open so that he could walk right into his rightful place. Hebrews nationalists fever was always at the peak on this particular day. The Romans have always have all the troops on high alert that day. They feared another revolt would be attempted by the leaders of religious radicals as happened in the past. Tensions were high. Why was the tensions high? Because they didn't believe like we believe. The people of Jerusalem knew their scripture well and on that day, four days before Passover, I'm sure the scriptures would have come to the people's minds. Zechariah 9, 8 through 9. But I will defend my house against the forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people. For I am keeping watch. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. See your king come to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fold of a donkey. This day, Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a colt. The day was predicted by Zechariah. Now Jesus would have been coming from Bethany, the Mount of Olives, riding across the Kindred Valley. They called it a valley, but it was more like steep canyon. He would have ridden across and actually right past the original city King David had built, which is now was on the outside of the city walls. And coming up on the ridge, he would have been right outside the city temple where he would have been directly been sitting right behind the wall by far the most prominent structure. Today in Jerusalem the dome of rock is the prominent feature. An Islamic holy site has having been built there over the ruins of the original temple. If you have seen pictures of Jerusalem this large gold dome always stands out. Just like if you're going into the Roanoke Valley, how the Dominion Tower stands out with the great big copper tower, that's how the dome of Jerusalem would have stood out. Right there was where Jesus would enter in the city four days before Passover on a colt right outside the temple. What a scene. Wouldn't you like to have been there and seen that? That would have been neat seeing Jesus coming in. But people there really didn't realize that he was the Messiah. Some of them didn't realize that. Just hearing through words, like I brought up at a meeting last Sunday. You ever heard the game Stir the Pot? You start one thing here, see what comes out at the end, how it's been changed. Can you imagine, for as long as anyone can remember, there has been a tradition that four days before Passover, the, the Messiah would come on a colt. And here is Jesus, four days before, on a colt, clearing head, clearly heading towards the temple. So the people go, so the people go crazy. They set up branches in front of him to honor him and to make the way for him beautiful. There were many visitors in Jerusalem at that time. Traditionally, Passover, at Passover, there's many visitors. Just like on the 4th of July for us, a lot of people go to Washington, D.C. to see the sights. Many of these visitors would walk to the temple, would walk to the temple branches in hand for worship. As pilgrims walked to the temple, they worshiped, they would sing a song, one of them well known, us as Psalm 8, 118, which is what they say as 
say to Jesus as he entered the city. They literally say in Hebrew, Lord, save us. Lord, please save us now. Were the people just getting caught up in the emotions of the day? Quoting a favorite psalm as Jesus rode by? A spontaneous parade of sort for Jesus. For Jesus, this must have been bittersweet time. For truly, for it was truly the prophecy being filled, fulfilled, and he truly was promised, was the promised Messiah, and truly deserved praise they offered him. But many of the same people excited for the entry for his entry into the city were the same ones to mock him. As he walked across with the cross on his back through the city of Jerusalem on the way to death just days later. Jesus would have Jesus would know who these people are. So why is everyone excited about Jesus? And then their abrevalence or against him? Well, at first they have a great expectation of Jesus. They praise him for two reasons. One, he performed miracles. Just before he arrived in Jerusalem, he has raised, raised Lazarus from the dead. You know that the word got around about that. And number two, they saw him as one who could make their lives better. By freeing them from politics or oppression of the Romans, Jesus does not perform any miracles for people who have after he enters the city. Teaching it, his teaching is serious and tough to hear. He teaches mostly about suppression and commitment. Not a message that the people was excited, expected a Messiah to teach. They wanted him, wanted to know how he was going to make their lives easier. They wanted to hear about getting rid of the problems the Romans. They wanted to hear a peaceful sermon. They wanted to hear a ear tickling sermon. They wanted something to appease their hearts. Jesus did not Jesus did come to make their lives better and to deal with life's problems, but not in the way they expected. Perhaps not in the way we might expect. Jesus doesn't come to give us a life, life uh, philosophy or he just wants to be a great example to follow. He does not come to make our lives good. He does not come to make our lives good people. He comes to deal with the burdens of sin that affects our lives. That has caused such grief, grief hurting relationships, creating distance between those we love, leaving us empty, and with that comes submission and commitment to God. Jesus is wonderful when he comes to make our lives easier to bear, but it becomes a different matter when submission and commitment comes into play. Isn't it how it is? If something's going to make our lives easier, we go along with it, but it takes a commitment for us to do that. Don't we put up a struggle? I know working in tire factory, when I first started working there, we was called tire builders. When I left, we was called machine operators because they made our lives easier where we didn't have to do such physical work. But a lot of people fought against it because it was taking away what they learned. A few years ago, Rosie O'Donnell was being interviewed. You know Rosie, the talk show host. When she asked if she thought God would be disappointed with her when she stands before him after she dies, she answered this way. God ought to be, ought to be happy. I'm doing the best I can. Well, to be fair to Rosie, what she said is fair. 
I mean, what better can we do than the best I can? To some degree, couldn't any one of us stand before God and claim that? God, give me a break. I'm doing the best I can. Do you really think that's what's going to be the criteria God will consider? Sapphira Lauren was being interviewed back in 1999 and the interviewer asked her if she was religious and what she thought of God. She said, well, I'm not really into it. I'm not a very religious person, but should I go to heaven? I haven't done anything wrong. My conscience is clear. My soul is white as orchids. I should go straight to heaven. I think, especially in America, most people would echo Sophia's words in one way or another. What about the people who welcomed Jesus on the day and cursed Him the next? Or still worse, ignored Him and went on with their lives as Jesus was condemned to death? Weren't they doing the best they could? I mean... They all had obligations to fulfill and couldn't they say to themselves like Sophia, I haven't done anything wrong. My conscience is clean. After all, how could I possibly be aware of the direct result of their actions would have? In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we saw my conscience is clear but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. We're at easily, we easily fool ourselves. A clear conscience really relevant. Just because my conscience is clear, that offers me no innocence. Just like a little kid, when they do something wrong and they apologize, they just say, I'm sorry. Is that clearly clear? Is that clearly clearing their conscience for what they have done wrong? Because a lot of little kids say that instinct. My wife teaches in a preschool class of developing handicapped kids, and when they do something wrong, most autism kids do something wrong. It's instinct for saying, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry," but. Their conscience really isn't clean because it's just out of habit, a habit that they're taught. When we consider Rosie's theology standpoint that God ought to be pleased that I'm doing the best I can, I've got to tell you, from biblical perspective, it does not does not hold water. Is God looking for us to do the best we can? Not once in the life and minister of Jesus did he tell anyone, it's okay, you're doing the best you can. Remember the women, remember the woman who caught red handed in adultery? They're going to kill her by throwing bowling ball sized stones at her. Jesus steps in and saves her from death. But then he turns and speaks, saying to her, Go and do the best you can. No. Go and sin no more. In fact, this is what Jesus tells people over and over. He does not expect us, does not expect our best effort. He is not like a tennis coach. Good effort. Saying good effort in the last game. A God who is happy with me doing the best I can is not the kind of God I need. If this is what we expect our whole lives perspective off is off, much like the people waving branches as Jesus passed by, it is not about doing the best I can. Leading leading a doctor feel prescribed life, we do not need. Personal self help gurus, personal self help books, or even help with their past life experiences. Dr. Mark Cohen, a specialist in guided imagery, 
is one of the, is the only person trained, qualified to work as a life between lives therapist. Isn't that great? He's, he tells you about your past lives. I love this kind of stuff. Then there's a description. Life between lives, spiritual regression begins with a two-hour session in which you recall significant past lives. Fascinating. After this, in one four-hour session, you can recall details of your experiences as a soul between incarnations. Meet your spiritual guidance and also people closest to you as they appear, as they enter your souls. Are they thinner? Are they better looking? For, for the first time, you'll be able to understand why you chose, why you chose your present incarnation with all the challenges. Yeah? Why didn't I pick a Arnold Schwarzenegger Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of body? What was I thinking? Why didn't I just pick a better looking body for me? Or a better life for me? What I love the most about these reincarnation people is that when they find out about their past lives, there was always princesses, great warriors, and such. Always something romantic. Haven't you noticed that? When people re learn about where they were in a past life, there's always a king, prince, something better than what they are now. They never have an accountant, a truck stop busboy, or a duck. They have never been a duck. Because that, my friends, is boring. As a past life therapist, you'll never get folks back for the second session if the story isn't romantic. Isn't that how things are? If it's something that's going to catch our eye, it brings us back again. Just as when I was a kid, I never went to church, but when I started going, I loved to go to church. Now, I didn't start going to church until my kids was... My 30-year-old was about one year old. We took her to church for the first time. That's the first time I got to go to church. I want to go to the office and just see... I just want to go to the reincarnation office and just see who's walking in and out of there and who falls for that stuff. What I loved most about these... What I love most about seeing people going in and out, the people's lives aren't changed truly. They just got a back history. If you go to church and learn the Bible, your life changes. Jesus was resurrected for us. He was reincarnated. He became our past lives. He lived for us. He died for us. So that day, over 2,000 years ago, when people lined the streets and were thrilled with Jesus, you know they were doing the best they could with what they had. With what they had, and you know the commitment and submission Jesus spoke about. Well, they weren't ready for it. Let's take it a step further. We can judge the crowds because they turned away from Jesus. But everyone, but everyone did. All of Jesus' friends, all of Jesus' disciples, even everyone was his friend the day he rode into the city, but the day he died alone, despised days later. No one was a hero. Everyone failed. No one even those who Jesus healed, even those who Jesus protected, those who Jesus raised from the dead, it turned out no one did the best they could. And that, my friends, is a good news for us because Rosie is wrong. God isn't looking for those doing the best they can. God isn't interested in something so Bureaucratical, bureaucratical. God is looking for people 
who can recognize what they have, broken lives, and recognize that they need healing. And that they need forgiveness in their lives. He is not looking for those who can make it. He's looking for those He's looking for those kind of people that don't need God. You know what? I spoke this morning several times about death of Jesus and that is what's a powerful thing and awesome thing. But the resurrection of Jesus is the power. The real transformation. And all of His friends, all His disciples, but one. Many of the Pharisees and Sadducees who condemned Him to death, thousands and thousands of those who lined the streets waving branches as Jesus passed by, later betrayed Him. They became favorite followers of Jesus Christ after His resurrection. And for the experiences, the great forgiveness of God, such great power, such great awakening, that even when threatened with death, they would not back down because now they could rely on something greater than themselves. They had the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. It was clear that they could not do it on their own. They tried on the, the day of Jesus' triumphant entry and failed a few days later. But now, after the resurrection, it is not about you or I doing the best thing I can, but about the Holy, about the Spirit of God coming upon us, doing the best He can for us. May the blessings of the Lord Jesus Christ be upon all of us, so you don't have to do the best you can anymore, but allow God to do the best He can through us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for these words. Thank You for allowing me to be the vessel for You. Please bless this church as they continue their ministry and allow them to be the light into the community, into the world, into the workplaces, and just being the light as they go about their daily business. In name we pray. Amen. And the next hymn is Only Trust Him.
God be with y'all and allow and allow him to do the best he can with you. For we all fall short of the glory that he does for us, but we need to allow him to work in us. Thank you.